It's a small Italian city called Antonio Prado. Really? It was the one. Chair of the Education Committee at the ISPN. Privileged to work with you as a co-chair, some years traveling around the globe and now in a digital way. First Friday of the month, first, first Friday of the new year, 2021, learning uh, a real different way to live, hope for the better to all of us today. 13 episodes of webinar series, Clash of Titans. Great topic, ventricular size, no relation to outcome of hydrocephalus treatment. The Titans will be introduced by our moderator, Dr. John Castle. My duty is to introduce our dear Don John uh, Castle. He is a very well-known uh, pediatric neurosurgeon and serve ISPN sharing the scientific committee for four years. 2009 to uh, 2012 in the meetings in Sydney, Australia, Goa, India, Jeju Island, Korea, and Los Angeles. Dr. John Castle, after an exceptional training in Sick Children Hospital Toronto, Canada, is pediatric neurosurgeon in the hospital university in Utah, South Lake City. He has been a uh, practice for more than uh, 20 years. He has been a visiting professor at numbers international centers and a frequent speaker at neurosurgical conference around the globe. He has over 160 publication peer reviewed journal, has well many books chapter. The subject of much of his scholar work has been hydrocephalus and shunts. All yours, Professor John Castle. Good morning. Thank you very much, Nelsie. So we have a very interesting topic this morning about uh, ventricle size and how it impacts uh, outcome for uh, children with hydrocephalus treated uh, by any means. And uh, we have two titans of the hydrocephalus world to uh, to um, debate the issue and they've been very accommodating probably uh, both having some similar thoughts on the idea but agreeing uh, to take uh, opposite sides so we can have an interesting discussion and see uh, see where this takes us so we have uh, Jay Reva Cameron who's going to speak in support of the notion that it's okay to let the ventricles get big Jay is um, a Canadian despite the fact that it said U.S. on the uh, on the introduction uh, for the seminar. And uh, someone contacted me and asked me if uh, Mr. Trump had bought Canada, but I said, no, he, they didn't, he didn't. Uh, they is Canadian, uh, although he did work here um, uh, for the beginning of his career. He's a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Calgary. He's a residency program director there and his entire uh, research career has focused on hydrocephalus and uh, especially on this topic. Our other Titan who's uh, uh, agreed uh, to uh, take the opposing view that we should uh, control the ventricle size a little more tightly, uh, even though in his heart of hearts, he, I'm not sure that um, he feels that way, is uh, Spiro Seguros, who has kindly agreed to do this. Uh, he's a professor of neurosurgery um, in Athens. He's the head of pediatric neurosurgery, and he's the current president of the European Society of, uh, of Pediatric Neurosurgery. So I, I'm going to um, moderate the session, uh, Spiros, uh, despite the fact that Jay and I both are Canadian, we both trained in Toronto, we both did our fellowship there, we were partners together, we've collaborated on hydrocephalus projects, we've published together, we've written grants together. I promise to be unbiased and give you your full five minutes of the, of the seminar to present. So. Um, I, I Let me share one, uh, one, um, Slide. So this is what we're talking about. You can see this patient on the left and the head size curve on the right. And with the uh, increasing popularity of uh, third ventriculostomy and especially ETB-CPC, we've seen more and more of this and it's sometimes referred to as permissive ventriculomegaly. So what we'd like to get at a little bit hopefully is how big is okay, um, for how long, um, how do we measure the ventricles? Is this, is this the appropriate way that you see here? what do we measure, and, and a number of other issues related to this. And we all know that the, the, the history of hydrocephalus has evolved so that 
uh, and even trichulomegaly was uh, treated for years, and I think that uh, pendulum may be swinging. So that's the topic for today, and I will turn it over to Jay to um, to present in uh, favor of the notion that uh, large ventricles are uh, okay. And I will stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Uh, thanks, John. And I, I hope the uh, bank transfer went through well, too. <laughs> okay, let me start sharing my screen. Oops. Okay, great. Well, the, uh, I hope everyone can hear me, but um, thank you very much for uh, having me. And uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. So um, anyway, and uh, I look forward to chatting. So again, I'll be speaking in favor of big ventricles. <laughs> um, I have uh, no disclosures. So just like John, I'll just give a little bit more detail. So this is, this is when I made this talk, this is sort of the patient who I've been thinking about. So uh, this is a, so imagine a six year old, a six month old girl, congenital communicating hydrocephalus um, he got uh, ETV CPC three months ago, so you can see right there, that's when they got the ETV CPC. Um, comes to see you, the fontanelle soft, flat, uh, development's perfect, babbling, sitting, rolling, pincer grip, feeling well, mom's completely happy, you get a fast head MRI, and the ventricles are still quite big. Uh, you can see that the, there is, the ostomy is still open and flowing, but those ventricles are big and the head circumference is not completely flat. And so what do we do? So let's first take a deep dive in the literature and see if that can help us out. But before that, uh, a lot of my talks can be talking about functional outcomes. I just want to give a quick spiel about that. So um, in hydrocephalus, frequently we talk about our outcomes are always shunt malfunction, shunt infection, which valves are better, which one lasts longer, um, and these are all critical, obviously, uh, to the clinician and to studies, but um, and critical, critical to the patients. However, um, there are some things that are probably more important to patients. And uh, this is an interesting study by uh, Rob Naftel and Mandy Tamber, um, looking at the attitudes towards parents. It's quite a large study, a large survey of parents, and just uh, looking at trade-offs and who, what would they rather see. And I just draw your attention that it's a big chart. I don't want to look at all of it, but you see the most important thing to the parents is their long-term brain function or their cognition. And things like minimizing the need for repeat surgeries are clearly important, but you can see there 82 versus 72 that um, cognition is still the most important, which obviously makes sense and I probably agree with. Um, and this is, this is brought in the dawn and the, the age of uh, patient-centered outcomes. In the United States, it's developed a whole new funding entity called PCORI, and uh, there's something similar in Canada, and I'm sure Europe and other places have theirs as well. And that's not to say that traditional outcomes are not important, but the functional outcomes are gaining importance everywhere in, in every specialty. So we're talking about things like quality of life, and in hydrocephalus, we have uh, the pleasure of having the HOQ, school performance, is my child going to university? What's their intellectual potential? And probably the best way to test that is neuropsychological testing. So most of my talk will be talking about neuropsychological results. And so again, the crux of the talk is we all have had this patient show up and then you go ahead and either shunt and do an ETV and say there's twins that show up and you, you shunt one patient and the ventricles get like that. And then you shunt his sister and her ventricles stay like this. And um, MR um, elastography was supposed to tell us why this happened, but um, I've been waiting 20 years and I don't think we're there yet. But so we don't know why one does this and one does the other, but does it even matter? So um, I think I'll just sprinkle a little bit uh, about support. Is there some literature in there that support is, supports um, and there's an old article here, maybe Spears is going to talk about it, but it's a retrospectively collected population. You can see it's looking at myelomeningocele and, and uh, aqueductal stenosis children, and they looked at IQ. 
most of their testing was, you're going to see this is a major trend. Most of the results are negative, but there's a little bit of a signal there, a negative correlation between big ventricles and, and neuropsychological results. Again, 41 patients, uh, but perhaps there's something there. Uh, there's another one, Abko Carney. Now, he looked at both, uh, again, a retrospectively collected. And so what that means is many years later, you call the families back and say, hey, listen, can you come in? This is an aqueductal stenosis study, older age, so you can do more complex uh, testing. And looked again at quality of life, health utilities index, and IQ. So again, you're gonna, no association was found between ventricle size and their uh, full-scale IQ. And it coincidentally, also didn't find ETV shunt any different in terms of IQ, but did find a negative correlation. So bigger ventricles had uh, a worsening quality of life and a worsening health utility score. Um, those were significant. Um, that's on one side. On the other side, and uh, the rest of the talk, we'll talk about this. Another retrospectively collected, this is a Ben Wharf study, uh, again from Uganda, looking at myelomeningocele's uh, babies, five to 52 months, but they did a Bailey's score of infant development, which is the best cognitive test we have for children under the age of four. Um, uh, English test, I should say. I'm sure there's some other tests in other languages. Um, and here, they also found that uh, the shunted kids were left with larger ventricles, but more apt to our topic is um, when he looked at ventricle size and cognition, there seemed to be no um, correlation. Um, we well, hear some work from Steve Shift, again, from the same population. So it's another, it's another Uganda uh, study. And uh, as anyone that's ever been to a meeting and seen Dr. Shift present, so anytime he says brain volume, not CSF volume, you take a shot and uh, you'll have a very interesting, you'll have a very fun talk. So he's obsessed with brain volume and rightfully so. And this study, what it's to, when it looks at CSF, does CSF have an association with cognition? You can see there the p-value of 0.09 that not, uh, but brain volume seemed to have a correlation. And he... His emphasis is always stop looking at the CSF size and start looking at the brain size. We'll come back to that. Um, however, the problem with the previous literature is the most samples are collected retrospectively. So by calling people back many years later, um, it's a substantial selection bias. So those that return are sometimes people who have problems or have an ax to grind or uh, people that are just more active in their society, and they may not represent the population at large. There's also generalizability issues. You see all these studies were sort of aqueductal stenosis only or myelomeningocele only, and they tend to be single-centered. Um, another, probably was the best study so far in, in this realm, um, but was looking at something different. Everyone knows the um, randomized control study of ETVCPC versus shunt published in New England Journal. Uh, again, Uganda, uh, six months, and they looked at ventricle size at one and two years. So the purpose of the study was to see which one was better from both from a development standpoint of view, and uh, there was no difference. But hidden in the results, even in their table two, is that um, the CSF volume decreased significantly in more in shunts, um, but the brain volume didn't. And then recently I saw it presented, uh, it hasn't been published yet, but this, uh, this group zoomed in on these results, uh, again, led by Steve Schiff. And um, I think we'll be seeing something in the literature that showed no, again, no association in ventricle size and cognition or brain volume and cognition in this group. But again, it's uh, a Ugandan population, and all of these children had post-infectious hydrocephalus, which is probably quite a bit different than North American and European patient populations. So this, this is, uh, so you're seeing the literature is kind of screaming out for a multi-center prospective study specifically on this topic, and also maybe from a resource-rich setting. Um, we need to minimize selection bias in these neuropsychological studies by getting everyone back. 
and then standardize the cognitive testing. So this was recognized by the HCRN, which um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with. John is the head of the HCRN, and it's a 14 center network and it's centered in Salt Lake. This was an eight center study, and we, we casually call it VENO study, but it's the ventricular size involvement in neuropsychological outcomes of Pete's hydrocephalus. And um, basically this study, uh, uh, it was patients, new patients with hydrocephalus, all etiologies, um, and school age kids. Uh, Preoperatively, they each got an MR baseline neuropsych. We found their, IQ, their school performance, like their GPAs, and did their quality of life. Then they went ahead and had their hydrocephalus surgery, and that was chosen by the surgeon. And then postoperatively, we collected the same results. Um, ultimately, it was 60 patients. I won't go through the entire consort diagram, but and the what did the sample look like? These are older children, so much older than the Ugandan population, and they had moderate hydrocephalus with the FOR being 0.5. So just for context, the FOR, there's an FOR of 0.5, and that's what they were preoperatively, and then postoperatively, their ventricles were more that size. And quickly, some results. The treatment reduced ventricular size, not surprising, uh, and that was the whole purpose. However, um, there seemed to be no difference between shunt and ETV in terms of ventricle size. But the purpose really was is there a difference in neuropsychological outcomes? And is there an association with neuropsychological outcomes and ventricle size? Do big ventricles still hurt you after, even after being treated? And after looking at 25 different neuropsychological tests, various GPAs of the children and their uh, quality of life, both their subsets and their total scores, um, 35 out of 37 showed no association on only two neuropsychological tests may have showed some signal that large, keeping ventricles larger uh, was deleterious to their cognition. Now, what about, well, maybe it was the change in the size of the ventricle. So we also looked at that. And so um, when you look at the change from pre-op to post-operative, um, those that change more, those that change less, there seem to be no difference in terms of their overall performance or functional outcomes, except for one in word generation. And lastly, just as an aside, we also looked at ETV versus shunt. Did one do better than the other? And there's a on three tests, ETV did a little bit better than shunt, but you can see the vast majority of these dots on the wrong side of the, of the red line, which indicates not significant. So no difference. And you can take that as either way, whichever way you like, but ETV is not inferior to shunting. So just going back to our case study. So again, we had a, a patient that uh, had, was asymptomatic, developing well, but uh, OFC or the, the head circumference was growing a little bit more, but the ventricles were big. But now we know that, that residually large ventricles are not likely uh, to hurt her intellectual perform potential. She's doing great clinically. She's got a big, but a, but a steadily growing head. And uh, based on the literature and based on what I've showed you, hopefully I've convinced you not to make fun of me for continuing to follow up and not changing or putting a shunt in her. I just, worry, I just say not quite so fast. It's not quite that easy. And it's never that straightforward because uh, one thing that we'll probably have a chance to chat about later is that head circumference was not too bad, uh, but frequently after ETV CPC, you have a patient that's doing equally well, and you have a head circumference like this, which is not good. And um, however, the patient's doing great with a normal Fontanelle, and this is a different story. Um, and so this, this what, what John was probably alluding to at the beginning is probably the biggest topic, certainly in the HCRN and, and anywhere is right back to the beginning of everything, when to treat hydro, like what ventricle size, what OFC to treat. And with the advent of ETB, CPC, the failures are a little more tricky to detect. And uh, I would offer that this is our white whale that we have to keep chasing. So thank you. John, I'll unshare. Oops. 
think is stop share. There, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jay. Um, excellent review of the the data on this topic. But as you said, it's uh, not a simple topic. And so let's have um, Spiros give us uh, some information about the other side of the coin and. Uh, um, then we can discuss in the long term, are these big ventricles going to come back and bite us? So Spiros, please. John, let me just share my screen. Uh, where am I? Uh, I need to go, hold on, for a PDF, I need to go full, uh, full screen mode. Okay. Um, Jay, that was a lovely talk. Um, in, in fact, well, I've approached the subject from a slightly different angle, but in fact, I think the two talks will, will, will end up being complementary as opposed to uh, uh, fighting each other, because I looked at it from a different angle. Um, but there's nothing like last minute changing the goalposts a little and, and John's bringing up a last minute question. <laughs> it keeps, uh, you know, it, it, it sharpens and focuses the mind. Um, uh, I have no disclosures to report. I'm just reminding you, of course, that the, the, the Greek word of hydrocephalus, which means water in the brain, it, it doesn't really describe the condition adequately anymore. And um, we used to, well, we used to have the terms active and compensated hydrocephalus, active meaning large ventricles uh, with raised ICP, compensated large ventricles with no symptoms of raised ICP. I'm not sure, I'm not sure even if these words describe well the, the current situation. What I'm trying to say is that there's a, there is a multitude of issues that uh, the more we dig into the subject, the more we need to, to address. And, and um, today's session will touch upon or is touching upon. So when you have a child, as Jay said already, you decide to treat, you do a shunt or you, or you put a shunt or you put an ETV. And then instinctively, when we treat a child with hydrocephalus, somehow we always look at the size of the ventricles to see if the treatment succeeded, if you put a shunt, then you do a scan uh, sometime later, see if the ventricles have gone down. When you do an ETV, you do the same. And um, well, we've been doing that for years, for 20, for 30, 40 years. But I, I guess if, if we could actually measure the pressure non-invasively instead, instead of looking at the ventricles, maybe that would be more meaningful. And maybe one day we will, but currently we cannot do it for any long periods of time. Long, long time ago, in 1996, when I was in England, those days was no electricity. Uh, I, started do, <laughs> I started doing various studies, which some of you may have read or you may remember, but I think they're actually very relevant to today's session. I, I started measuring ventricles and, and doing various things, which I will show you. And although they're old and dusty, I think they're quite relevant and I think they're, they're, they're still valid as it were. These are some pretty pictures of reconstructed ventricles. Uh, at the top is a normal kid and at the bottom is a hydrocephalic neonate before you treat them and, and you can visually tell the difference. Anyway, um, I, I, the difference with my study as opposed to other studies that I, I did a whole bunch of, uh, of, of normal children, about 50 or 60 normal children who had MRI scans for other reasons, but children with no pathology, no symptoms, no nothing. And and before measuring hydrocephalic children, I measured the normal ventricles, uh, and I did um, and I, I did normalize for age. And you see here, this is the overall graph. This is male, female. This is the mean values, which make no no uh, difference for you now. But this graph is of importance. If you see, if you normalize for age, um, roughly uh, just under. 2% of the, of, 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 the, of the skull volume is ventricles throughout the age span. So there seems to be a, a system, if you like, um, in operation that wants to maintain throughout ages a, a, some kind of normal relation between how much water you have in the head and how much brain you have into your head. And um, I'm guessing that when this, when this homeostasis is disturbed, you get... Um, you get uh, the problems that we're discussing now. Uh, that obviously was published. And then a series of studies came with various, you know, shunt and ETVs and so on. I'll show you very briefly the results. At the top, you have uh, an old-fashioned differential pressure. This is a, you know, a patient with an old-fashioned differential pressure about the fold above. You see how the ventricles get small rather quickly. And here is a patient with a delta valve, as it so happens, that the ventricles get smaller, but less 
quickly if you like they get smaller but but uh, in a more gentle fashion um, look at this graph this is not well this is times normal each, each patient I took the volume and then I I normalized against uh, sex and age uh, normal volume and a nominal a mean normal volume so I, because I wanted I wasn't so much interested on the volume itself but on the on how many times the normal was the, was the volume at that particular time. So you have the red line is the new shunt, new shunted patients and the and the green line is the revisions. But look at this: when a new a new child comes along and we decide that needs treatment, whatever that is, whether pressure symptoms, vomiting, and so on, or, or when it, when you decide the child needs treatment, the the volume of CSF is on average twenty times normal. Twenty times normal. Think of any other pathology in the body that you have a value 20 times the normal, and uh, probably you'll be dead. If your sodium is 20 times normal, you'll be long, long gone, and so on and so forth. So it's quite incredible that the system has tremendous accommodation. But this is more interesting. Look at these uh, children that came in for shunt revision. They had a volume eight times normal. So children that had a functioning shunt that were around here, when the shunt blocked, before they, they came to medical attention, the, the, their volume increased quite a bit to eight times. And then you can see how the volumes after treatment, how it goes down. And, <clears throat> and you can see that at 12 months where you can say, okay, the situation is stabilized. In the new shunts, the, it's, it's still more than, more than uh, uh, normal. It's, it's higher than normal. The volume in the, in the revisions is, is, is just above, is just above the normal. So, the, the first observation is that newly presented patients have 20 times the normal volume and patient blocked at eight times. So, and the question is why, why the ventricular volume increased so much uh, before the symptoms raised? And this is the first indication that the system has a certain buffering ability, has, you know, can accommodate high ventricular volume. Okay. Um, the thing with shunt obstruction is more interesting. The unpublished material, I, I didn't come around to publish it, that when, when, they, um, when these kids were revised, their skull volume, their intracranial volume decreased after shunt revision by 30 mil. Uh, even in older children, 10 year old children that we have, they have closed sutures and have thick skull. So, which is incredible. You know, you have a shunt, you have a child that has shunt malfunction, you change the shunt, the ventricles go down, but the intracranial volume goes down, which is something, of course, that you wouldn't expect, which means if you look at it from the wrong way around, if you look at it from here, when this child start, when the shunt started uh, uh, packing up, we started shunt obstructing gradually, not only the ventricular volume increased, but the skull volume increased as well in an attempt to accommodate. And you may say, well, what the hell are you talking about, Spears? My 10-year-old kid, the skull will grow a little big. Uh, in the first few months of obstruction. Well, these are the facts, and that's, uh, uh, whether, whether I like it or not, this is the fact. So um, there's, there's more to it than just a pure hydraulic mechanical tube blocks, you know, ventricles get big and that's it. Um, the effect of VTV, uh, these are the scans of a, of a child pre-op, one week and three months. You see, you can say the volume's gone smaller after ETV, but not so much. And look at the, look at the graphs here. When they started, they, all these neonates that started, some older children as well. By the way, the ones that have very high volume, you know, 20, 25 times the normal are the younger children. All the children uh, with aqueduct stenosis that present have uh, four or five times normal volume. And then the, the volume goes down a little, then it plateaus out. And in some of them who are well, it even goes up a little, uh, you know, at the 12 monthly period. So it, ETV behaves slightly different. So to summarize, there's a different reduction of volume. And, uh, you know, uh, at one year, the, the shanty kids, they, they will have uh, between 1.5 and four times the normal volume. And uh, the ETV will have between two and, and seven times normal. So there's a second indication that the system tolerates high ventricular volume. Um, but, but a bit like what Jay said, these kids, these kids are okay and these kids are okay, which is unusual. You can be all right if, you, if, you're, if your ventricular size is twice normal, it can be okay if it's five times normal. This, this doesn't, it's, it's something peculiar. So what we regard as failure for shunt, because if your ventricles are big after you put a shunt, you think, well, probably my shunt is not working. We regard it as a success for ETV. 
And this, there is no obvious answer to that. Uh, we're all quasi-scientists, we're surgeons, so we're not exactly scientists, but uh, John is more scientist than the rest of us. Uh, and Abdul Khan, if he's in the audience, he's more scientist than the rest of us, but the rest of the surgeons are, well, we are scientists, but there's no point. I can't understand why in, in one set of patients you regard success for the ventricle to go big, to go small, and in another set of patients you accept, oh, well, the ventricle is not gonna go small by ATV, but that's how it works. So what is the definition of success? Of course, we, we don't know. And I put it to you that the parents said the definition, what's the definition of success after treatment? Well, my child to live a normal life. Okay, we all like, we all agree with that. Um, that means surgery went well. So what's a normal life? for a child. How normal are hydrocephalic children? Jay alluded to that quite a bit. And if they're not normal, is it because of their ventricular size or is it because of other factors of their disease? And, and you all know that uh, with Apkul Karnik being the, the, the spearhead and, and with Shlom Konstantini, um, we ran a, a, a trial for several years and the results have been published, the IIHS, the International Infant Hydrocephalic Study, which took a, a clean group of patients, only pure aqueduct stenosis, and John and Jay have contributed to this, uh, to this trial with, with patients and so on. And I if I remember correctly, John was also on the uh, safety committee of that trial. So I think he's seen the data several times. Um, these are clean group of patients, pure aqueduct stenosis, so not, nothing else to interfere with their development. Uh, and um, the, the primary outcome was a neurodevelopmental outcome in five years. And from the 158 patients, there were new developmental data on 78 patients. The strength was that it was a prospective study, which you don't see very easily these days. As we all know, all these indices, I'm not gonna go into detail, the, the health utility index, the, the health outcome questionnaire and the Denver uh, test. Um, very briefly, the health utility index, overall, it was a, a 0.91. And the ETV and shunt very similar, very similar numbers with no difference. In other words, just to, to make it very plain, children with treated acrodactinosis were, as far as health utility index was concerned, 90% normal, which is not bad, pretty good, uh, with no difference between ETV and shunt. The HOQ, again, uh, 0.82, no difference in the two groups. Again, you could say 80% normal. I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but if you wanted to put the message across, you would say they're 80% normal, which is a very good, very good uh, result. And, um, and on, the, on the Denver, there was no difference as well. Again, uh, 70, 70 out of 100 the scored, which again was pretty good. And you would say, how big were the ventricles of these children? All the, they were all pretty good. Uh, uh, and for the sake of this discussion, how big were the ventricles? Very similar results to the to the previous measurements that I had conducted and published uh, that I showed you. The, the therefore, with a normal value roughly being 0.37, the, the shunt had 0.38, so pretty pretty close to normal. ETV had a slightly bigger number of 0.46, which was statistically different to the to the to the shunted group. So in other words, we're all normal, but the ETV had um, bigger. Uh, uh, bigger than normal ventricles, which which agrees to to the stuff that are published, and and that is that is puzzling. In the end, is it good to have big ventricles? Is it again is, is it good to have big or small ventricles? Is not is not helping us. It's good that aqueduct stenosis children have a good outcome, but it's not helping with respect to the to, to the actual issue of debate. So overall, a good outcome. Uh, and the, ventricle, the ventricles uh, are bigger than normal after ETV. Again, it's a third indication that the system tolerates a, a higher than normal ventricular volume. And then you may say, okay, what about small ventricles in shunting children? And a lot of uh, both yourselves and a lot of people in the audience will have kids that have small ventricles. And you say, um, what about those? Well, what about those? Uh, when we're communicating by email to organize the, the session today, Jay, I think, wrote somewhere, I don't believe there's a slit ventricle syndrome. And uh, and I thought, well, that's a good that's a good uh, that's a good phrase to to latch on to and, and ag agitate him a little to 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 see what he thinks of these two patients. Um, in 2012, I um, I I I saw a boy. He was then seven years old. He was treated as a neonate in another center here in Athens. He they they put a medus valve without sacking guard at the age of three or four months, something like that. And then he had five revisions in, in those seven years for, for headaches uh, loosely. Um, and they did the settings and so on and so forth, the metals valve, no improvement. 
And I, I didn't have handy those pictures of the 2012, but they had small ventricles, very similar to the ones that I show you. So at 2012, I took the medals valve out and I, I put a, a pedigab, I don't know, some of you may use it, is a, a valve that has an anti-gravity device, a, a, an anti a gravitation device. And um, his symptoms got better uh, uh, for a number of years. And, uh, and the MRI scan after changing to the, to the pedigab it was like this, but in fact, even before changing the valve, they were pretty similar, the ventricles, very small ventricles, you could hardly see them, so-called slit ventricles. <coughs> and um, and um, with the same ventricles before the kid had problem, uh, after I changed the valve, didn't have problem, okay? So he ran all right for two or three years, but this little guy, um, is actually a tag for dope uh, uh, athlete who goes in competitions and his, and his father is actually the, um, his coach. And they came to me uh, three years later, 2015, uh, his father rang me to say, look, we need to come and see you because it's not right. Okay, he came to see me and he said, um, it's not very, he's having headaches, sometimes it's not very well. And he said this fantastic quote, you know, in, in, in the latest match, uh, the, the, in the middle of the match, the kid screamed to his dad, you know, I don't know where to kick. Every time I try to kick, I see double and I don't know where to kick. And his dad said, well, kick them both, you know. <laughs> so uh, by kicking everywhere, the, the, the kid won and it was great. This is the, um, this is the photograph of that match. Uh, he's, my, he's my patient. We have the same first name, Spiros is called. He's a great guy. And um, for those of you, uh, who you don't allow your patients to enjoy life to the full, I remind you that life is very short. So if your patient wants to do the type of door, let them kick themselves and let, you know, let them kick and be kicked to the heart's content. So far, he hasn't come to me with a broken shunt. Uh, and um, so after this episode of double vision in the middle of a game, um, well, I had to do something. I put an ICP bolt and, and when he was sitting up, uh, it was really negative pressures. And you can imagine what the pressure would be like when he was doing all these fun and games during Tag Condor. I did something which in retrospect, I shouldn't have done. I, did a, I took out the, the, the governor to put a probe up to have the, the benefit of the, of the twisting of the setting. I went up to 16 because I thought the, the, the pressure setting was low, but in fact, he was having headaches. And in the end, it turned out that the anti-gravity setting was, was, was too low. I, I changed back. I went back to a, to a 10 foot with a 40 centimeter anti-gravity. Then he needed another adjustment. I, I added a little extra on the anti-gravity front and with 50 centimeters of, uh, of gravitation uh, device, he was all right, and, and he's, still, he's still okay, and he goes to his competition. So um, Jay may believe that slip ventricle syndrome or whatever you call it doesn't exist, but, um, but there's at least one patient in the whole planet that, uh, that has a problem. <laughs> and there's another patient in the whole planet that um, is, is from all from when I was in Birmingham that um, I, I, I um, shunted him originally with a Delta valve in 1999. Um, then he started having problems. Then I put an OSV uh, with this. These were his ventricles at 2003. And um, this is a photograph of the Camino monitor. And you can see this is a small digital camera because the mobile phones in 2003 did not have cameras on, believe it or not. Uh, so th those days you couldn't take a, uh, life was much simpler. You couldn't take a photograph with your mobile phone. And, and see here, he was writing all those negative pressures and so on. Then I had to do skull expansion. Then I had to change the Delta. And then I got him right, but it was a, it was a long drawn out process. Again, a little guy with very small ventricles, smaller than normal. So what I'm trying to say is that having too much water into your head or having too little water into your head is not good for you. It's not. It's not good to drown in water or 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 uh, or dry out in your head. So um, Jay is right. Nowadays, is uh, this chronic overdrainage or whatever you want to call it is, is is rare. Thank God we don't see it very often because it's rare and, and unusual to put just straight differential pressure valves 
in neonates. All these children that I saw had uh, differential pressure valves when they were small, and they went into a situation of, uh, of very small ventricles very quickly, and then they had problems. And um, I changed the valve to an anti-gravity without doing ICP measurement when I, when I get that setting, and only if I get into trouble and, and I get recurrent symptoms when I measure the ICP. Uh, and every time I, I measured the ICP, I recorded negative pressures on the, on the sitting position. So that's a topic to discuss later if you like. But um, there's a lovely paper that I was involved when I was working in Paris in 99 under, under Sam Rose's uh, uh, guidance. Uh, uh, Pepe Cinali published it. Uh, measured, we measured pressures at the top of the head, the supratentorial compartment, and at the infratentorial compartment. And all these kids that get all these symptoms, they have a differential pressure. You have a negative pressure at the top and a positive pressure at the bottom. And, and, and uh, 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 Christensen has postulated that this results into, into shear stressing of the midbrain, which gives you midbrain dysfunction. It's an interesting paper from the very uh, old 1999. If you can dig it out, I urge you to read it. On those days where you could put two pressure balls on a, on a patient, because these days it's not so easy. One at the top, one at the bottom. And, and last, uh, about, uh, last, I will address a little the question that um, John uh, sprang upon us last minute. Uh, I tried to evade the question, not successfully. It was then I realized that the fight was rigged. When, when the question appears last minute, then anyway, I'm only joking. So John wanted us to specifically touch upon what are you going to do in a child that has big ventricles and your head is big, and otherwise it looks okay, okay? Uh, so what are you gonna do? So how high can you go as far as head circumference is concerned, as far as ventricles are concerned, or how high can you go? If you have a kid, what's the threshold for treating a child that has very big head, uh, uh, well over 97% as, as Jay showed in his slide, no obvious pressure symptoms as well. Uh, how, what are you gonna do with this kid? Well. For the sake of provoking discussion, okay, after all, that's my job coming second, I will tell you what will happen if you don't treat a child, okay, that needs treatment, okay? The phrase is a child that needs treatment. If you don't treat a child that needs treatment, this is what will happen. I met this little fella uh, a few years ago when he was six years, he had a very large head, uh, this was his uh, MRI scan, which actually a typical aqueduct stenosis. But very, by the time I met him, he was a very big head. Um, he was 97% over the 97th uh, centile from, fourth month, uh, from the fourth month, month of age. A bit like the, the graph that, um, that Jay showed. The, his mother is a, is a nurse, not a pediatric nurse, but his mother is a, is a nurse uh, up in the north of Greece they live. He walked a bit late. There, he's not bad intellectually overall, he's going to school, um, but at some point his walking deteriorated. And uh, before coming to me, he's had uh, Botox in his legs to help his walking. Uh, he was branded as spastic diplegia and he was treated as spastic diplegia, a kid with a very big head. Uh, and as I said on the MRI scan, there was a, a aqueduction, a huge vent, as I showed you. And um, the pediatric neurologist that follows him up, who's actually a very experienced pediatric neurologist, uh, said to me, well, I, now I don't think he will improve if he gets treated. It's just too, too late. So it's, it's all gone, now, six years, whatever. Um, so in 2017, despite predictions to the contrary, I did, uh, I did an ETV. Uh, I must say that I was rather scared because as you saw, the cortical mantle was very thin. And I had visions of, of uh, uh, brain collapsing, subdurals, and so on and so forth. But uh, my lucky star saved me, and, and we didn't have any subdurals. We did an ETV. Pressure was high, as described by the fact that CSF shot through the endoscope at the time. I didn't measure it. Um, and, and the kid was better. Walking was better. He felt better. And so I thought I did something useful. But of course, at 2020, uh, uh, walking deteriorated again. The father rang me once or twice. I did an MRI scan. The, the storm, I did not have such a good flow uh, on, the, on the phase contrast study. And I, I decided to redo ETV. And uh, at this time, I thought, give it a little bit of better chance 
uh, do some lumbar punctures to, to, to help ETV work a little. So did two or three lumbar punctures. He was reading very high pressures, 30, 35 centimeters of water, very high pressures. Um, after the third lumbar puncture that the, the readings, you know, lumbar punctures in a space for two or three weeks apart. Um, after the third lumbar puncture that the, the reading was still high, I decided I'm not gonna win this. Uh, so I put a I put a shunt, and uh, and I, I put a programmable uh, valve, and I kept it at high. Uh, I think that I did this operation last July, six seven months ago. And my intention is to gradually lower him down to save myself from subdural. So far, uh, I seem to be winning. Uh, don't have subdurals. His, his, his symptoms improving, so we did something useful. So. For the sake of provocation, I tried to, to throw a wild card and say, well, this is what will happen if you don't treat the patient. Now, I'm not saying, Jay, that this, is, this will happen to your patient. All I'm saying is that when you, when you well, you could postulate, well, this is the, nat the natural history of an untreated uh, neonatal ventricular, ventriculomegaly. Um, and of course, then you ask me, when do you do treatment? And I will give you the very scientific answer is uh, by gut feeling. John wanted us to, to say, when, when, how do we decide to treat these children? And I could not find a, a proper answer. So I, I put four, four criteria, but really they're very vague. You, when I have a kid that's very, very well over 97%, they're obviously the large ventricles. He, he has, looks, looks very abnormal and he has a suggestion of falling behind the milestones uh, I, I decide to treat. But really I go more, more on gut feeling rather than on objective measurement, either ventricular size or whatever. And I suspect that if we could do, as, as, I, as, as I showed you on the, on the research papers, if you, could, if you could chart the volume, how many times a normal, you will, you will find a reading above which uh, you have to treat this, these children. Um, and by the sake, you know, for the sake of, of completeness, I would do anything with Zacharax, otherwise they shan't. But really to give you my consolidated view after 25 years of, 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 of uh, dealing with this subject, I think, uh, uh, because I cannot prove it to you, that there is a, a ventricular CSF volume, probably around 120 mil or roughly five times the normal below which there's no intracranial hypertension and above which there's a kind of threshold five times the normal. This is why I said perhaps this could be a, 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 a point to, to decide how to treat. So, uh, so there's five times the normal ventricular volume above which I think you get symptoms of raised ICP and then intracranial hypertension and then your treatment brings you down below that threshold. So and this, in particular applies to these ETV children that they have still big ventricles, but they don't have symptoms, they're well, because they fall below the, below the buffer zone that, that the system can accommodate. And, um, and obviously, if my hunch is correct, the smaller the ventricles when you start, the better, especially for ETV children, the better the chance of it working. So I came with this arbitrary figure of five times the normal plus an extra 30% because on another paper that published uh, uh, ETV and uh, hydrocephal after posterior fossa treatment, I saw that when you, uh, after you remove the posterior fossa, your ventricular volume falls below 30%. And then if you're below that cut of 120, you don't need treatment. If you're above, you do need treatment. So my arbitrary not non-scientific cutoff point is five times the normal your ventricle size your ventricle volume plus an extra 30%. So after treatment, you, you lose that 30% that you are in the, in the normal range. Um, so this, so and, and I'm just concluding that the, 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 all this system, if you like, the ventricles, brain, parenchyma, all this, all this head system, I think is designed to tolerate higher than normal volumes. Uh, but, but after a point on the high side, you get, you get to trouble. But equally, you need a little bit of fluid for your system to run. So if you lose too much CSF, then you get into problems or well, different kind of problems, uh, but you get into problems. So there's a, there is a, there is a buffer cover. There's a tolerable uh, range of, of volumes. And probably, although this statement hangs in the air with no, with no substantial uh, support, it probably 
the pressure may be more important than, than the volume. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave you here and we'll, we'll uh, discuss. Thank you very much. Let me just see. Uh, stop sharing. Okay. Thank you very much, Spiros. Very, very interesting. Um, so um, we've had a number of questions uh, submitted um, uh, all over the place on this topic. I think there's uh, interest uh, in solving it. I don't know if we can solve it in the next 10 minutes, but um, maybe let me start off by asking both of you. So uh, Spiros, your um, uh, studies looking at ventricular volume uh, from a number of years ago uh, were done by measuring slices, it looks like, and creating a, a model of ventricular volume. And Jay, you, you quoted um, data from uh, Steve Schiff measuring brain volume, um, both of which are, are very complicated to do. So uh, how do the two of you um, measure the ventricle size today in, if you see a child in clinic? I, I don't know that either of those methods are practical on a daily clinical basis. Is that correct? Spiros, maybe? Yes, in a, it, that's exactly the point. When you see a patient in your office, you cannot do this. Uh, one day with AI, maybe a computer program will give it to us, but currently, as of today, you cannot do that. So really, I, I, I do what you do. I look at the pentacles and I try to get an idea. Uh, I, do, I don't strictly go and measure the, the FOR, but, but I, I well, you know how it goes. You got, uh, with your trained eye, you have a cutoff range where you say these are big ventricles. They're, they're not, yes, you know what I mean. In my little head, having seen lots of them, I have small ventricles, gray zone, and big ventricles. Okay, w which I think they are the same with with your with everybody's idea. Small ventricles, you don't need to do anything. Big ventricles, no discussion. The gray zone, if you ask me what is the gray zone, I couldn't say to you, but I, I would say roughly, if the, if the third ventricle is more than about a centimeter, I, I think we're past the gray zone, roughly. Third ventricle as a single, if you look at one, if you want to look at one, structure if you look at the third ventricle i think is a good represent representative of the whole of the whole thing i don't know if i've answered your question but... and then john so all all the hydrocephalus patients i see in clinic i for the most part uh do an for just because i think um uh just sometimes when you eyeball it you can sometimes be fooled and so it like I find like probably a 95% concordance with, oh yeah, those ventricles are unchanged. My eye thought that, the FOR thinks that. But sometimes that 5%, sometimes it can sneak up on you. And uh, so anyway, I like to do FORs, uh, they're quick. And um, yeah, I, I, I would, I do find that uh, sometimes quantifying the ventricles is helpful because the eye doesn't always catch things. And obviously, what do you do with that number? The FOR is always compared to the previous. So I don't have a standard, like I don't have that one centimeter mark of the third ventricle like Spiro said or anything like that. I just, it's always compared to that patient as their own control um, because, you know, some of those kids, the preemie IVH have very thin cortical mantles and, um, you know, their, their third ventricles are, they're two centimeters wide when they're doing great, you know, so. Okay. Thank you. So um, another, uh, here is an interesting one. So what is, uh, so, so your interpretation of ventricle size, is it the same at the time of initial treatment versus when you're looking at the ventricles to in, in follow-up? Do you mean same threshold, do you think? Is, this, is that the question, you think? Yeah, I think, um, how, how do you interpret? Yeah, I, I think it's, how do you, um, do, do, I guess, do big ventricles concern you in the same way at the decision to treat versus the, the assessment of the treatment later? So maybe I'll go first, Spiros. But the, I mean, to me, um, 
everything is their symptoms. And I mean, okay, and how they're doing their development, their symptoms. I mean, that's why I emphasize the functional outcomes. I mean, that is the true endpoint. Um, yes, the ventricles are a nice metric to follow pre and post. Um, but again, and usually life is easy where the patient gets sick, their development's down, they're vomiting, their ventricles are up, they need a shunt revision. It's pretty straightforward. However, it's not always that easy. And when there's discordance, the patient's doing well and the ventricles are the same. Uh, they didn't come down as much as I want. I'm unfazed by that. The trickier part is what if the ventricles are sneaking up and the patient's doing well? That's a tougher question. That's usually when I call around the world and ask my friends for advice. Um, and, uh, but typically, uh, mostly, usually, if the patient's doing great, I'll sit on it. And I know that's controversial, but what do you think, Spiros? Well, I'm, I'm pretty much agreeing with what you say. There's, there's straightforward patients that do well, okay, no thinking required. The, the, the gray area is the patients that look well to you. They come and look well. The parents say the child is very well, but their ventricles may have gone slightly up. Whether there's a shunt or whether there's an ETV, the, the, the difficulty to do something is the same. If it's a shunt and the ventricles start, begin to grow up, you're thinking, oh my God, we're heading for a, uh, we're heading for a shunt revision, but you can't say to the parents, oh, well, I think we're heading for a shunt revision coming electively. Obviously nobody does that. And the same with ETV. Well, if the, if the signal, the, if the flow signal begins to fade, it, it, it's a difficult decision to say, ah, well, I, I'm going to take your child and operate because I don't like the way the MRI scan looks. Th these, are the, these are the difficult patients, as you say. The, the ones who are okay, they're okay. The ones who are not okay, it's obvious. The gray area is difficult. And, and you go more by clinical instinct than anything else. Uh, now, in, in this day and age of, 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 of clinical trials, where clinical instinct falls, I don't know, but I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is why, well, when you deal a lot with a subject, then you get the feeling this patient, is, is, it looks as if he's going to get into trouble and, and, and you, you start elaborating on the topic with the parents or you think, oh, well, that's not so bad. I, I have to say, that I've been caught up several times, uh, both ways, you know, both saying we need treatment and, uh, and need, there was no need to, to do something and saying, oh, we don't need treatment, even though the, the, the MRI scan the ventricle are bigger. And then the child coming in with block shunt days after they've seen me in a regular outpatient. So the, the gray area, what do you do with a child that comes into your office well, but the ventricles are bigger whether it's a shunt or a ETV, I think that has no answer. What do you do with that child? It has no answer. Uh, the, other th the other thing with that is, is we, we sometimes act like the ventricles aren't as small as we want. We better do something. But we really have very little control. Like the, the, it's a little bit hubris for neurosurgeons to think, oh, I can give you the exact ventricle size I want. Um, Perhaps in my, maybe it's just me, but everyone, the patient, the brain wants what it wants, for lack of a better term, and it's probably something to do with its elastins or its compliance. That um, a treat. Once you take all we can do is take away pressure, and the volume remains as per the uh, compliance of the brain. So I feel like we have very little control, and like the shunt design trial, John, showed that we have very little control. So. so we probably have enough questions uh, posted for another hour. Um, so I apologize to people who've submitted the questions. It's going to be difficult to get to many of them, and they're, they're, they're great. Um, uh, one is, um, what, how do you, um, do you pay attention to um, periventricular uh, changes on the MR that looks like uh, the fluid is going through the brain? Um, yes. Or or other uh, advanced MR techniques such as diffusion changes, do those impact your decision making? Yeah, yes, obviously, yes. Yeah, sorry, Trans I went first. Yes. Yeah, yeah, transepenemal, I agree. Uh, what to do with, I, I think probably the person's referring to DTI imaging. 
uh, what to do with that. I don't think uh, there's some promising results in DTI, but there's nothing that's ready for prime time and nothing that the processing time still take too long. So I don't use diffusion tensor imaging. But per periventricular lucency is quite a good indicator that things aren't, aren't going very well. And uh, well, if you're not gonna pay attention to it, don't do MRI scan then. I mean, just, just see the patient clinically and send them off. So, so um, you should pay attention, yes, of course, yes. So this one will probably um, differ around the world, the role and availability of neuropsych testing in assessing children. We, you, you've described studies that do it as part of a study. Is this part of your practice? How accessible is it? And should we be pushing hard for it? Is it really important enough that we should be pushing hard or asking families to pay for it themselves if they have to? Go ahead, Spirit. I mean, it's in everyday clinical life, it's impossible to use neuropsychological testing when you see a child uh, in your outpatient clinic. Uh, I have to be honest and say, I don't use it regularly. If I have it, okay, it's nice, I read it, but I'm not sure what to do with it. You know, you need to have sequential testing over a long period and I'm not sure what to do with it. If the, if the piece of paper that I have doesn't say good things, I'm not sure what to do with it as a neurosurgeon. Uh, I'm not gonna take any decision to do something uh, treatment-wise on the basis of the neuropsychological testing. I don't think anyone does. I don't know, well, I, I, let's see what Jay says. So, so I, I don't use them in my regular clinical practice. I have only used them only in the context of, of scientific uh, trials. Yeah, I sort of I, I sort of agree with that. I, I mean, number one is I use them not to discuss that particular individual's treatment, but more in terms of their shunts blocked or not blocked, or it's more um, use it as a way that this is a patient that's doing okay but struggling and needs more support from school, from OT, PT. You know, it's a way to help sort of give that the gold rim of care, the extra care to take this child that's, you know, maybe struggling a little bit. There's nothing I can do with the shunt, but maybe he can have some more resources. So that's not the sort of like non-medical things or, or, or peripheral medical things. But in the long term, I think they're important because they help determine changes, like to, to go back and study and look at your practice in total and see, you know, uh, Maybe I should be doing more ETVs, less ETVs, that sort of thing. So again, they don't, I don't use them to make individual changes on surgery, but um, it is, I think, critical. And I would support, I think that is something that if you can, if you have the resources, these patients should be getting them every three years. Certainly when they're age five, I think everyone should get them. The teachers would love to see these and how to optimize these children. I think it should be used more. There's some centers like uh, St. Louis that they could just write something in the orders, neuropsych testing, and it happens. And um, we're not there yet in Canada. We don't have the resources, but I sure like to be. The, the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of these tests are actually done by developmental pediatricians who follow these kids anyway. Uh, or at least this is, this is in my, in, in my case. Uh, most of my patients are followed up Anyway, not because I send them to, but you know, the, uh, most of my heterophilic children are followed up by a developmental pediatrician, and and they deal with that. But um, yeah, but the idea of having a test at five years is nice. The question is, how do you go about it? You know, for, formally, and what do you do with it? You go back every it? five years in your practice, and you see what happens in the last five years. Uh, who pays for it was another matter. Even if you have it for free. Every five years of your practice, you take stock and see what happened in the last five years and then change. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not very practical. John, I think you're muted. We're getting a little beyond uh, the hour, but I have one question I'm sure we can solve in the last uh, minute and a half here that says, um, with uh, big ventricles, and what, what is thought to be a mild elevation of intracranial pressure, 
what valve will you choose? Are programmable valves or anti-siphon valves important? Um, and when is a fixed pressure valve okay? Always, or in my, like, I don't know. I was taught by the, Dr. Drake, I'm a disciple of Dr. Drake and heavily influenced by John Kessel. And so um, I'm a fixed, fixed pressure valve. I like the simpler valves and leave the programmables to the complicated kids. But um, that's a massive topic. <laughs> Spiros, what do you think? Uh, absolutely. I, 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 I have implanted single figure programmable valves in my career. In my entire career, single figure in children. Yeah. Um, a couple of cases like the one that I showed you, but single figure programmable valves. I, I, I don't think there's any value of programmable valves in children unless there's something complicated, which, which is a separate topic, as you say. I think fixed pressure. I use the ones that have anti siphon, but I mean, there's lots of them. There's no. Uh, Val which valve you choose is a little bit like uh, is like football is like everything else which which football team you follow you follow and so on. There's, I think they're all pretty much the same. I use I use the ones that I use, but the, the uh, I've used them all. I've used Delta. I've used OSV. I've I've used um, uh, I use Pedigar now. I've used them all, and uh, every time I change is because. I had two infections in a row on this very scientific topic, you know, very scientific criteria, two infections in a row. I blame the valve, obviously I didn't blame myself. And I say, okay, so go on to the next. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, sorry. No, no, and, no. In, and in terms of changing, you know, like, I think just like, like we have very little control over the ventricle size. And there's some people that you, you, your partners can put in a programmable valve and you can adjust it and the, valve, the ventricles will change a little bit. But there's many people you can adjust it any way you want and the ventricles look identical. Patients sometimes say they're better. Um, but again, I don't think we have as much control over the ventricle size as people think we do. Yeah. Well, I think that um, we're, we're uh, seven minutes past the hour and we have a bit of consensus on the last question. So maybe that's a good time to, to call it. Um, I think uh, my comment is that we have studies showing that the large ventricles in the first year or two probably have an affected developmental outcome in a focused population with postmeningitic hydrocephalus. Very, very nervous about what it will mean to those children when they're 15, 20 years of age. That's going to be very difficult to answer. Um, but, um, but very interesting discussion. Thank you both for excellent reviews and, and uh, congratulations on your work in this field and, and please continue because we really need uh, answers to these, uh, to these important questions. So um, I think we'll uh, end the session there and, and, and thank everyone for, for joining us and for tons of excellent questions here. I wish there was another way to discuss all of these, but. Well, no, pleasure was mine to join you, very nice. Sandeep, you. you came last minute. Sandeep, please Hi. join us. Sorry, Happy New Year to everybody. And I apologize, I was stuck in the operating room. I knew I would be, that's why I had asked um, my very able companion, Nelsi, to step in all the way from Brazil in my absence. But thank you very much, uh, Spiros. Thank you, Jay, and thank you, John. And it's lovely that we began the new year with, um, with the debaters agreeing with each other, a spirit of friendship uh, that we look forward to in a new year, uh, which has to be better than uh, the previous year. Sandeep, in your absence, I said it was a rigged fight. There were two Americans against me. In the end, there were two Canadians. So it, got, it, started, it started worse and it got better in the first minute <laughs> when they both disclosed they were two Canadian citizens. <laughs> uh, it was a great session, great session, great session. Good. And thank you very much, Nelsie, for stepping in. In fact, Nelsie should rightly have been the education chair this year. And um, it's only that a virus has robbed her of her uh, chance to be the education chair from the beginning of this year. So by all rights, she should be moderating all the future debates from now on. Is well, you right, can Nelsie? continue, dear Sandeep. <laughs> <laughs> you can continue for a while, don't worry. And excellent audience today, more than 150. 
active people with us. And for those that miss these excellent uh, lectures, uh, the lecture was recording and are available and uh, on ISPN uh, website YouTube channel. You can see uh, at any time these wonderful uh, questions. I don't know for the answer that we couldn't, uh, the question that we couldn't answer. Maybe if they can send email to Linda and try to, to send to the, the speaks, speakers. I don't know if it's possible to answer to them. When you get Spiros to answer his mail. <laughs> I don't no. know. Great. I think on that note, Nelsie, with your permission, can we just uh, inform uh, the audience about the next debate? Sure. I'm going to keep you. you, Linda, if we can share your screen. We're going to keep you in suspense about the speakers for the next debate. But the next Clash of the Titans is slated for Friday, the 29th of January at 1 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And the topic is Middle Fossa Arachnoid Cysts Without Progressive Symptoms Are Best Left Alone. And I have actually analyzed what each speaker will say and send it to them so that we know who's saying what in this debate. But I'm not going to let you into the identity of the speakers. We're going to keep you in suspense because it's a new year and we want you to be in suspense. So this will be disclosed uh, shortly. But that's the topic where we hope you will tune in again uh, when we have the next ISPN clash of the titans so on behalf of the education committee of the ISPN thanks John Sparrows thanks Jay and we hope you will join us when we host the next clash of the titans on the 29th of this month bye bye good morning good afternoon or good evening depending where you are on the surface of this planet bye -bye. thank you bye bye, bye, -bye.